I glanced over the questions. We should be fine. Okay. Sounds good. Cool. Yeah. So the first question is just, can you um, introduce yourself a little bit? Um, where are you from? What are some things, important things that you want, you know, people who either listen to this interview or read sort of the transcript to know about you and sort of what brings you to, you know, advocacy against the death penalty or yeah, all that. Okay. All right. So my name is Movita Johnson Harrell. I am from Philadelphia, born and raised in Philadelphia. Um, I have five generations that specifically come out of West Philadelphia. Um, I've raised my children here. I have been in the fight to eliminate gun violence since 2011 when my 18 year old son Charles Johnson was murdered in a case of mistaken identity. Um, but even before that, I am a, co a four time co-victim of homicide. My father was murdered in front of me when I was eight years old. My only brother was murdered in 1991. And after my son died, my cousin was being a peacemaker at a New Year's party and a boy put a gun to his chest and pulled the trigger. So in my fight in advocating um, to eliminate gun violence and more so to address the social determinants that lead to gun violence, because my fight, I became the founder of the Charles Foundation. Mm -hmm. Charles is an acronym for Creating Healthy Alternatives Results in Less Emotional Suffering. Through the Charles Foundation, we work to fight for the people on both sides of the gun, right? Mm -hmm. Because we understand that one bad, first and foremost, one bad decision, and it could have been my son on the other end of that gun. And mm -hmm. on top of that, we understand that there are social determinants that lead to gun violence, social determinants that lead to young people picking up guns right. and, and participating in these acts of violence. So we've worked to address poverty, people living in food deserts, um, housing scarcity, mm -hmm. lack of employment, lack of opportunity, lack of um, connection to resources. So we have worked in all of those arenas here in Philadelphia, but also nationally to empower communities so that they do not participate in the violence and so that they do not wind up going to jail. Mm -hmm. Because in communities that look like mine, our children are either going to the graveyard or going to the prison. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm honored to be able to speak with you even more hearing that. Um, yeah, so I guess, yeah, my question, sort of the next question is like, what are your views on the death penalty? And how did those, how did you come to believe in those things? Um, and yeah, like, maybe did you, at any point, did that change? And what is the, what are the reasons for, you know, your, your sort of opinion changing? Right. Um, okay. So I have, I have, never been a supporter of the death penalty. I think it's inhumane. Mm -hmm. um, I think as a civilized society, we should not be putting people to death. When you look at the death penalty, what that says is that people are not redeemable, right? We talk about rehabilitation. And I often say you can't rehabilitate someone that's never been habilitated in the first place. Mm -hmm. We have to habilitate people first. Mm -hmm. um, so what we say when we talk about putting people to death, for crimes that they've committed, what they what that says is that that person is not redeemable. That right. person is not worthy of being given the opportunity to um, change their lives, right? And one thing that we've seen even more recently with social justice and criminal justice reform is mm -hmm. that there are a lot of people wrongly incarcerated. Right. And there have been people over the history of the United States that have been put to death when they were actually innocent. And we have not found out until after the fact. Mm -hmm. So I don't think any of us have the moral compass, have the moral ability, or have the right to mm -hmm. sentence anyone to die. And mm -hmm. that's just not, you know, putting a needle in somebody's arm that I'm talking about. That's right. also death by incarceration. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, is there like, is there like a time in your life when you sort of were, when you really started to think about the death penalty or is it just sort of something you've always been against and you sort of known um, that you've been against it? Um, I think coming from an urban community and knowing all of my life people gone to jail, mm -hmm. um, that I've had an idea of incarceration, what that means and what the death penalty means. Mm -hmm. I have a stepfather that is currently 
um, incarcerated in Phoenix. He mm -hmm. has been there since 1976. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, since 1975, I'm sorry. He was actually um, convicted for murdering my father and he did not murder my father. And mm -hmm. I think it was, I developed the idea pretty young that I would not be in support of the death penalty because I knew personally someone who was sitting in prison right. who was innocent Right. But who was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Right. Right. So I think I developed at a very early age the idea of, you know, not wanting to see people die in jail. Right. right? Right. And even more so with criminal justice reform that has been happening over the last one, two decades, when we talk about incarcerating people and giving them second chances, well, if, if we're just throwing people away, there's no way that we can give them a second chance, right? If right. we're incarcerating someone and we're telling them you're getting life, and, and I think you know that I did work at the district attorney's office. Yeah, yeah, that's, so yeah. I, yeah. yeah, so I was actually um, supervisor for victim witness services right. and criminal justice reform. Right. And through that office, you know, the, the, the DA Larry Krasner was very supportive of all the work that we did. Mm -hmm. And we were actually looking at ways to provide healing in communities, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because often um, in these situations where someone may take someone else's life, these people know each other. They right. live in the same communities. They work right. in the same communities. The families know one another. So we wanted to provide a space for healing. And that came directly from my experiences growing up, having a brother that I saw go in and out of jail. Mm -hmm. He had mental illness that was never properly treated. Mm -hmm. um, so he wound up in and out of adult correctional facilities and watching him be beat by the police and watching him go into jail. And, and, and I thought at any time that could have been my brother. Right? right, who could have taken a life and been sentenced to prison without the possibility of parole, or who could have been sentenced to the death penalty, right? right. So because I've had the ability to, I guess, put myself in other people's places, mm -hmm. that, that's why I formed, you know, the ideas that I have around um, social justice, criminal justice, and the death penalty. Right. Um, and just being in a position where I have been able to go into the DA's office and create healing circles, right? Mm. And be able to go up to Phoenix to have a conversation with an inmate about how bad he wanted to make amends to the family that he harmed. You know, the, the general society typically doesn't see that picture. Right. 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 All they know is what they hear in the media, what right. that person is portrayed to be in the media, and mm -hmm. they don't see the regret, the remorse, the humanity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think all of that has actually culminated into what has made my beliefs, um, what, what has become my beliefs around the death penalty and even life in prison without the possibility of parole. Right, right. Wow. That's, yeah, that's really amazing. Um, and with those healing circles, did you like, like, uh, I guess I'm, well, this, this sort of goes into the next question. Like a, a narrative that you often hear is like the death penalty is this, you know, this thing to give victims, family members, like the, the sort of, I don't know, retribution, like the, right. the closure for what happened to them, what happened to their family. They, you know, lost somebody. And so what I sort of hear you talking about is like, you know, providing something that's actually doing that, like a healing circle that's actually trying to do something like that. So right. I guess like, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I, I, I'm sort of just thinking out loud, really. But I, I mean, I think that it's a really interesting, that model is a really interesting model that you're putting forward. Um, yeah, as, and can exactly, I say this, Ray? Yeah, people, absolutely. People, people think that, so when your family member is taken from you, that's the automatic reaction. Right. right. An right. eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Right. Um, they need to make me whole. And, and, and you think by the other person dying, that makes you whole when mm -hmm. in actuality it does not. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I had an opportunity to go through a two week trial in 2013 wow. um, for the two boys who shot my son. Mm -hmm. And it was really tense. So the first day of the trial, you know, there was the, my side of the family and 
all of my, my kids are so popular, all of my kids' friends and my mm -hmm. family showed up, mm -hmm. you know, and then there were people on the, the defendant side and everybody's in the same space. And it was right. so much tension that the first day that I walked into the 11th floor of the CJC, I called for prayer, right? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't want my children's friends. So even to go back a little further, when my son was murdered, people wanted to retaliate. Right. And I didn't want that. Right. right. I said, let's let the criminal justice system do what it's going to do. Let's yeah. I want this done right. I don't want anybody hurt in my son's name. Right. But when we got to that that hallway of that courtroom and, you know, I, I need to say some of the defendants, um, family and friends were being very rude to my fan. They were treating us like we were on, on the defendant side. So mm -hmm. what I did was I shut everything down. I called for prayer. Right. Mm -hmm. And I prayed for everyone that was in this proceeding. Mm -hmm. I prayed for my son and I prayed for the defendants. Wow. And I went through this two week trial, Ray, mm -hmm. and it was basically, you know, I wanted, I wanted um, justice for my son. Right. I need to say that. Right. But about midway through this trial, something came over me. Mm -hmm. I would walk onto that floor every day because I was the example for my family and friends, right? Right. I was the example. Right. So I couldn't come in there hostile and ready to argue with people. So I had to come in to that courtroom every day and mm -hmm. say good morning to everybody, even the people on the defendant side, mm -hmm. and even hug one of the defendant's young wife, his wow. young wife, you wow. know. Um, but midway through our trial, um, something came over me. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm a very spiritual woman. I need to say that, you know, it's very obvious what I practice. I wear a chemo. I am Muslim. Right. Right. Um, but I'm even bigger than that. I'm a spiritual woman. I've made Hajj. I've done things for my own spiritual growth. Right. And midway through this trial, you know, um, something came over me and I called a family meeting. Mm -hmm. And I knew that these boys were going to be convicted. My son's shooting is on video. Wow. So mm -hmm. You can see the boys clearly walk wow. up to the car and, and shoot up the car that my son was sitting in. Right. Um, and when I called the family meeting, I said to my family, um, we need to forgive these boys. Wow. And I said to my family and I asked their permission. I said, when it's time for sentencing, I want to ask for mercy. Hmm. And my family said, we don't agree. Right. right. And, and I said, that's fair. That, that's fair. Your feelings yeah. are your feelings and they're valid. But this was my son. Right. Right. And I said, I need this family's permission to ask the judge for mercy for these boys when it's time for sentencing. Right. And they agreed only because they love and trust me. Wow. Yeah. Um, but when the trial was over and it was time for sentencing, um, the one young man, Troy Thornton, mm -hmm. got life in prison without the possibility of parole. Mm -hmm. And the second young man, Sean Jones, the judge was going to give him 24 to 40 years plus two gun charges that carried seven years each. Mm -hmm. I made my plea before these two young men were sentenced. Mm -hmm. And the judge actually, Troy Thornton was, because he was um, convicted of uh, first degree murder, right. he was automatically sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She said she could not, that was the sentencing guideline. Right. Um, but the second young man, instead of giving him 24 to 40 in the two gun charges, mm -hmm. she gave him 12 to 24 years. Wow. That's amazing. And dropped the two gun charges. Hmm. So she literally cut his time in half because wow. of my plea for mercy. Wow. And she sat on the bench and she said, in 20 years I've been doing this, I've never had a mother stand in front of me and ask for mercy for her son's murderers. Wow. But you know what I understood after going through that two week trial, Ray, mm -hmm. was number one, those boys did not have a mother like Charles Johnson had. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Mm -hmm. They came from drug addiction. And, mm -hmm. and don't get me wrong, I come from drug addiction. I got 25 years in recovery. Right. But Charles had a present mother. Right. Right. Who, who was clean and able to take care of them. These young men had been in and out of juvenile facilities, you know, in and out of adult correctional facilities. And I actually had a homicide detective say to me, 
you know, um, we knew that the one boy that, that got convicted of first degree murder, mm -hmm. he, the detective said to me, we knew that this boy was going to kill somebody. Charles was just a pure victim. Wow. So he said, you know, we had him as a kid. He used to harm animals. And then we had him in adult correctional facilities. So what I thought at that time mm -hmm. was, in all reality, it's not their fault, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If these boys were in the system mm -hmm. and they knew something was wrong with these boys right. and they knew that they had the propensity to commit homicide, right. it was our responsibility as a society right. to do what these boys needed for them. Right, right. So I turned to the homicide detective and looked at him like he had two hands. And I said, so they're not responsible for my son's death. You are. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. That really is a, I mean, it's just like an incredible, wow. It's an incredible story and example of like, yeah, what sort of the root causes of so much of this that's going on. Absolutely. Yeah. And not only that, the conversation that I have with right. survivors, and right. I think I'm, 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 I'm in many instances unique in my stance on criminal justice, mm -hmm. right? And, and on um, justice in general. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I tell, you know, many survivors that I work with mm -hmm. is that no, my son didn't carry guns. No, my son didn't do drugs. My son was doing all the right stuff. Right. But here's the thing. My son could have been in a position where he was with some peers mm -hmm. and could have had access to a gun mm -hmm. and something could have happened. Right. And my son could have been on the other side of that trigger. Right. All it would have taken was a split second to make a bad decision. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the work that you do with the Charles Foundation is about sort of removing the possibility of those decisions to happen. Absolutely. So yeah. we do a couple things. We 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 work with young people right. to give them another perspective, right? To see the right. world through a different lens, right. um, to empower them to make better decisions. But we also work with the community to mm -hmm. be empowered, right? Mm -hmm. um, to take back their communities, to raise their voices, and to make sure that they are doing what they need to do to have safe communities. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for the work that you do. That sounds, I mean, so important. Um, thank you. Yeah. So let's see, just to, I don't know, go through these questions a little bit more. Um, yeah, I, I was wondering, like, what are some common narratives that, I mean, we've already touched on this a little bit, but what are some common narratives that you hear about the death penalty that you disagree with? Um, and what do, you, what do people usually say when you tell your story? Um, so I'm sort of thinking like, you know, when you tell, when you talk about your experiences, how do people respond and, you know, what do you, how do those conversations, what do those conversations look like in general? If that, does so that make sense? I, yeah. I'm sorry, what did you say? Does that make sense? Does that question make sense? Yeah. yeah. So people are actually typically respond mm -hmm. like you do. Okay. Like you just did, you right. know, when I tell my story and, and I also talk about my perspective right on justice um and when pe the the narratives that you know that's how people get justice that's how we make survivors whole you know i share my experience with these going these boys going to jail that, that did not fix me that mm -hmm. did not make me whole mm -hmm. you know um do i feel like i got justice for my son yes but i feel like as a society mm -hmm. My hope is that those boy, that the at least the boy who can come home is mm -hmm. going to come home better than he went in. Mm -hmm. To mm -hmm. me, that's justice. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. For wow. him to be able to yeah. really get rehabilitated, to mm -hmm. be able to go to programs and get a vocation or a skill or a certification, and mm -hmm. you know, um, help some other young people while he's in there and come home and be able to take his life back and live his life and be a positive influence in the community that he lives in. That's mm -hmm. justice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Is there, and continuing on that, like, are there other sorts of, is there other sort of things that you've done that have sort of made you feel more whole in, in the wake of, besides the sort of the, the criminal process? Um, so the work of the Charles Foundation has 
um, been a saving grace for me. Mm -hmm. Um, my son's homicide was devastating. Right. So we're a really, really tight knit family. Um, I'm an ACOA, an adult child of alcoholics. So I didn't have that tight knit family growing up. Mm -hmm. Um, so being able to raise my children and my entire adult life, I fought to protect my children. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't know if you're aware, but I left Philadelphia Mm -hmm. to protect my children. Right. So January 15th, 2008, I moved away from Philadelphia because the summer of 2007, my sons knew nine boys murdered in our neighborhood. And I packed my family up and we moved to Lansdowne, Delaware County. Mm -hmm. And three years to the day I left, January 15th, 2011, I buried my son. Wow. You know, so I tell people you can't move away from the problem. But my entire life, like, we were the family before my son died when we lived in Philadelphia. We were the family that would get a 15 passenger vehicle, cram everybody's kids in, mm-hmm. take them to the beach, take them up to the Poconos, make right. peanut butter sandwiches, you know, get right. juice boxes. Right. We had the big backyard. We rescued dogs. We had a basketball court. My mm-hmm. son's fixed the bikes and electronics. So everyone gravitated to our house. Right. We were that family. But mm-hmm. because of my own hum- intimate experience with homicide growing up Mm -hmm. in my mind what I said was maybe if I protect this community this community will protect my children Mm -hmm. right and the community was not able to protect my children and I lost my son and on top of that people don't realize when when you go through those kinds of experiences you have to deal with issues of mental health you know with PTSD Mm -hmm. and those are lifelong consequences Mm-hmm. of the violence mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and not even that even the young the people who are going into prison for committing these crimes they have their own issues that they have to deal with they have to live with what they've done number one then they right. have to live behind bars right number two right right so there are consequences and, and it's like i always say it's like tentacles of an octopus it just reaches into every area of your life right right Wow. Yeah. I can only, yeah, I can only imagine. Um, hmm. I don't know if I answered that question. No, you, I think you answered, well, yeah, I mean, I think you, you answered, you, you said a lot of amazing things, so. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess, yeah, are there, like, specific, like, well, no, I'll, I'll just move on to the next question okay yeah and we can come back to that that's helpful but yeah um i guess yeah i'm i don't know my next question was like you know a little bit more about the work that you've you've already talked about with um against doing work against gun violence um and you've already yeah so maybe we can i'll just go to the the one after that but um so what do you see so i i understand you were also like a in the legislation in um in pennsylvania and so I was sort of wondering on a sort of practical strategic level, like what do you see as important strategies for those of us who are advocating against the death penalty and other prison reform as well? Um, but for those of us opposed to capital punishment, like what are um, some good like strategies that to be organizing ourselves um, sort of in, in the context of today? Um, and yeah, I, and I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, you have insight into city politics you have insight into state politics like in pennsylvania do you think specifically there's like good strategies that we could be taking um that you've seen really make change kind of thing yeah that's 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 my question um so so we have some really good allies in pennsylvania Mm -hmm. um when we're talking about criminal justice reform and we're talking about you know eliminating the death penalty and even eliminating life in prison without the possibility of parole and on top of that um letting people who have been sitting get an opportunity to go in front of the parole board Mm -hmm. so I, i think one of the best strategies could be to actually align with the allies who are already in those arenas, Mm -hmm. right? Um, There is already some really good legislation in amending sentences. Um, I know Senator Sharif Street had introduced introduced some pieces of legislation in reform where after 25 years, people would be able to go in front of the parole board. Mm -hmm. I think 
um, strategies need to be a couple things. Number one, they need to revise the entire um, parole board, right? Um, because right now it's a unanimous decision. Mm -hmm. And if one person does not agree, then people, and I'm talking about even more recently when people went up for um, parole review, and we're talking about people, we already know that their studies have been proven that people age out of crime, right? They mm -hmm. age out of violent behavior. Right. We got people 70 and 80 years old who are right. sickly and going in front of the parole board and they're being denied parole, right. right? Which is absolutely insane because it costs so much more for us to take care of those people in prison than it would be to let them out to live out the rest of their days in society. Right. So I think number one, the parole board needs to be revised. That's number one. Number right. two, align with allies who are already in the arena, who are already doing the work, who have mm -hmm. already created, we already have, you know, uh, quite a few pieces of legislation um, mm -hmm. through Senator Sharif Street, through State Representative Jordan Harris. When we talk about um, criminal justice reform and um, allowing people the opportunity to go in front of the parole board, but also changing sentencing guidelines right because right. nobody else in the world does what we do right right our, our sentencing guidelines are are so old and mm -hmm. antiquated right um that right. they need to be yeah. changed right? Right. right um and so i think we even have a lot of uh colleagues that are on the right um who agree with mm -hmm. a lot of the changes that is being proposed right now in legislation right. so one re revise the parole board number right. one Right. Number two, um, join with allies creating legislation. Right. Number three, um, join with the allies, the, the, the boots on the ground, grassroots allies like right. Cadby and YASP mm -hmm. and Decarcerate PA mm -hmm. who are trying to push that envelope. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That makes sense. Yeah. And I think that that's really important to like have, you know, this organization, an organization that's so sort of single issue be be working with the other organizations to try to build yes. something bigger because I feel like that's how change is going to happen rather than yep. just focusing on our one our one narrow thing um yeah cool um and yeah so I guess like do you see I'm sort of I'm also sort of curious and like you you have you're somebody who has many sort of different hats and you have done a lot of different kinds of amazing work. So how do you sort of see, you know, what's going on right now with the pandemic, with the uprisings, with, you know, the person in office in, our, in the White House, who I will not say his name. Um, but I, I guess like, you know, what do you, how do you view this moment? And like, what, how do you sort of, do you think it has, I guess, how can we like do anti-death penalty and sort of other work that's um, in, in the context of this moment? Um, it's sort of a yes. big question, but I'm just sort of, what are some things you're thinking about in, in that context? Yeah. So we live in a strange new world, right? Absolutely. So one of my fights with the Black Lives Matter movement is that it's too narrow. Okay. Right? We, we mm -hmm. always talk about, you know, police reform, but Black Lives Matter is more than just police reform. Right. Black Lives Matter is um, criminal justice reform. Right. We know that mass incarceration mm -hmm. is just a new slavery, right? right? Really? So part of the Black Lives Matter movement's ass should, yes, it should be police reform. Mm -hmm. um, um, yes, they could include in there defunding police, but it should also be criminal justice reform, right? Mm -hmm. And what that means is um, new policies on sentencing, um, mm -hmm. new policy mm -hmm. guidelines on sentencing, Mm -hmm. um, and really looking at who's there and how we can change what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we're at a critical time because I also say, you know, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, you know, um, homicide is a Black Lives Matter issue. Mm -hmm. Black on Black crime is a Black Lives Matter issue. You mm -hmm. know, easy accessibility to guns, social determinants, mm -hmm. poverty, mm -hmm. drugs. Mm -hmm. It's a powder keg. Right. Right. And that's why we have an increase in gun violence as we speak. You know, we're at about 190 mm -hmm. 
Well, no, excuse me. We were at 185 homicides this time last year. Right. We are at about 250. Wow. Wow. So I think that the Black Lives Matter movement needs to open the narrative up a little more Mm -hmm. on their issues. And Mm -hmm. we can't just focus on, you know, the brutality of the police. Absolutely, that is an issue and that needs to be addressed. But there are some other things that we can address at the same time. You know, we have a national, a worldwide platform right now. Their voices have been raised right now. Mm -hmm. Now is the time to talk about mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. Now is the time to talk about those issues that are happening that affects people on a on a daily level every single day. Right. So right, I right, think right. I think right now would be an opportune time because we have people's attention, right? Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. the the nation has the world's attention mm-hmm. with the Black Lives Matter movement. So mm-hmm. I think now would be an opportune time to include that narrative about mass incarceration and unfair treatment and all of that right, to be able right. to make a change. Now, we could really make some change right now, or the other thing is we may have a civil war. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems more and more likely every day. <laughs> I laugh, so, but I should be laughing, yeah. This country is divided, and that's really sad. Right. It's, it's really sad. This shouldn't be a them against us. Right. You know, we, we need to all be able to coexist. We live here. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, just jumping back to the gun violence question, um, have, has, that, has like the death penalty ever come up in your, in your work to sort of, you know, get at the root of gun violence? Has that ever, like, I don't know, are there any intersections that I, that might be sort of hard to see as somebody who hasn't done that work? And if not, it's okay. Yeah. So I'm going to say, you know, going into the office with D.A. Krasner, there was a lot of um, backlash because people knew that he was progressive um, and that one of his agendas was to change sentencing guidelines. And I was very privileged to sit on the sentencing committee in the D.A.'s office. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, And one thing that he did not agree with, and we had that in common, he did not agree with the death penalty. And he Mm -hmm. said, I will not give anyone the death penalty. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was in agreement with that. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I think, I think that's, what was the question again? I'm sorry. Uh, Yeah, I'm just sort of like. Oh, oh, I remember, I remember now. So it was on gun violence and the intersectionality being, you know, so a lot of people. I think people in Philadelphia or maybe even nationwide Mm -hmm. have been trained that that's their response when they lose a loved one to Mm -hmm. violence, right? Mm -hmm. I want them sentenced to death because that is what you always heard. Every time you talk to a victim and there was an arrest, Mm -hmm. um, I want them sentenced to death. Mm -hmm. And because I was the supervisor for victim services and I sat in those meetings, you know, I would have to talk to them about that. You're you're probably not going to get that sentence, right? Mm -hmm. Because really the guidelines say 21 to 23 years. Right. For a homicide. Those are the guidelines. Right. right. So I would be the one having those with the district attorney who was working mm-hmm. on their case, um, mm-hmm. having those conversations with family members. Mm-hmm. But I'm telling you, truthfully, 90 uh, percent of people who lost someone to homicide would always say, you know, I want that person to get the death penalty. And we would literally have to tell them the history of the death penalty and, you know, what the national sentencing guidelines are, how Philadelphia is so far behind the times Mm -hmm. and our antiquated laws, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, So that was always an issue. It Mm -hmm. was always an issue. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Makes, yeah. It's, yeah. Just talking to you is really making me think about, you know, how important, like, doing death penalty work, anti-death penalty work on the one side and anti-gun violence work on the other and how this, the Absolutely. two are totally yeah. We're connected. connected. Yeah. And I mean, and criminal justice, but you, you can't just yeah. do one without the other really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I think I only really have like two more questions. Uh, okay. And one of them is just, is there anything else that you like want to add to this conversation? Um, I don't know, like anything that, yeah, about like the death penalty or your experiences or. 
I'm sorry. Someone no worries. Can hear you. Are you can okay? You? Oh, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, I was just wondering, yeah, if there's anything else you wanted to add to this conversation um, that would, that you think would, you know, that people don't often think about maybe or anything like that. I think, I think what people don't often think about is what I often tell um, victims who are going through the criminal justice system or even victims we are helping with the Charles, at the Charles Foundation. Mm -hmm. you know, one bad decision and that could be your family member. Mm -hmm. then, what's, then what's your response going to be? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Wow. And what do they say? They, well, some of them yeah. makes them think twice, right. right? And some of them are, well, it's not my family member and they took my baby. And, mm -hmm. and, and then, because I'm very comfortable having the conversation about the social determinants because it plays, people minimize the part that it plays in, in violence that happens in urban communities, right? Mm -hmm. People live in poverty. People, our kids can get a gun faster mm -hmm. than they can get a meal. Mm -hmm. And we wonder why they're doing the things that they do. You know, right. they can't get a job. They don't get adequate education. Right. They live in awful conditions. Right. Some of them, their parents are on drugs in the streets. Mm -hmm. You know, we have houses right now in Philadelphia where kids will go into an abandoned house and take over the house. And there's like eight to 10 kids, kids mm -hmm. raising each other. Mm -hmm. You know, so... You got to look at the whole picture. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I understand losing someone. I've mm -hmm. lost a lot of people mm -hmm. to violence. Mm -hmm. I understand. But one thing I also understand is that one bad decision, just one. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, cool. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for all of this um my You're last welcome. yeah i mean it's it's really moving to hear you speak and very you yeah i've i'm i've already thought in new ways that i hadn't thought about before so i really appreciate that and i think oh, a lot of people will. thank you yeah of course um so yeah I'm, and my last question is more of a personal question um just on a personal interest i'm sort of curious like what your opinions are and you touched on a little bit earlier but you know on defunding the police people are talking, you know, prison abolition, police abolition. What is, you know, when you hear about that, what do you think of, you know, I'm coming from somebody as a young person who, you know, this is something that, oh. Bless you. I'm sorry, my daughter's in dialysis, so. Okay, well. Yeah, you, so that's wanna... another thing that, okay. that, that, no, it's okay. okay. Um, that's another thing. I think I talked about, you know, the trauma that comes mm -hmm. with, um all this violence right. and you know people want they, they think someone dying for their lost loved one makes things better or someone going to jail for the rest of their lives for their lost loved one makes things better it doesn't right. you know my son came to pick up my daughter she was 19 she's been living with this trauma locked in her body for nine and a half years mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. A month after my son died, my daughter stopped crying. She said she didn't have a right to die. I mean, a right to cry because her brother came to pick her up. So as a result, since my son died, we've had to deal with, you know, unmanageable hypertension. And now my daughter has stage five kidney failure. Wow. She needs a kidney. She's 28 years old. Wow. On dialysis three times a week. And this is all, the doctors can't figure out why her blood pressure is so uncontrollable and I'm telling them it's the trauma that's locked in her body. I don't know if you know that I'm a social worker by trade and training. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I'm a social worker by trade and training. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a trauma recovery trainer. Mm -hmm. um, but to live with it is something different and what it does to your family and, and to the people that you love mm -hmm. is something different, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but 
I, I just, I, I want people to just take another look at this because no human is disposable. Right. 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 And do we have people that make bad decisions? Absolutely. Right. And, and in many instances, a lot of these people are young people. And we know that we have studies that have shown that the brain does not stop developing. The brain doesn't become fully developed until mm -hmm. they're 25 years old. Mm -hmm. Right. So some of these mistakes that they're making, yes, they're detrimental and they're bad mistakes, but that doesn't mean we throw them away. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. They're human beings. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah, this has been amazing. Um, so thank you for having this conversation with me. Um, yeah, so I will be in touch about, um, I mean, yeah, I'll be in touch about like, what I think, what I'll, how, what I'll ha do with this interview. Um, okay. And I'll let you know before like it goes anywhere or is published or anything like that. I don't, I mean, okay. I, and I would, I would love to see your end result, your end product. Okay. I can't wait to show it to you. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. And what, I, my last question is where, where in West Philly are you from? Cause I was, I was also born and raised in West Philly. Um, but in, in 47th and Baltimore is where I was born. But. Oh, you're on Baltimore Avenue. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I'm from the bottom. You know okay. where the bottom is? I don't, I don't. Nashua. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Not far. Yeah, totally. Yeah. North, north, right. Okay. Yeah. So now I'm in the park side area. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm living in Pittsburgh right now, but oh. I was born and raised in West Philly. Yeah. Till I was okay. eight. Okay. Cool. All right. When you come to Philly, you got to come see me. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be You're in welcome. touch. And if you have any questions or anything like that, please let me know. Um, okay. Yeah. And really, thank you again. This has been really amazing. So. Yeah. You're welcome, Ray. Anytime. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.